Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So this week, as the holiday of Pesach ended uh, in the evening, and um, you know, before I moved the dishes back down to the basement, um, even before I went to the store to go buy um, every leavened bread product that Giant had uh, to go eat, to eat it, uh, I turned on my phone uh, and, I, and I looked at the news because the news had been a little uh, dicey going into the holiday and I turned on my phone thinking like, please let, you know, everything have just gone away. Everyone has been nice, everyone's been returned, everyone's having their finals and commencements or whatever they're supposed to do and we can go to, you're shaking your head, you did the same thing, yeah. And uh, we can just have a nice Shabbos where we talk about uh, the, you know, small olive in Vaikra or something. Uh, <laughs> It's a joke that's funny to three people, and I appreciate the three of you who chuckled for that. But <laughs> we, uh, and, and as the head shaking shows, the uh, was not the case. Uh, the, the world remains a, t a, a, t <clears throat> a scary, um, a fraught place uh, for our people and in general. And this moment actually has a name in our tradition. It's called Isru Chag. Right, the sort of the ending of the holiday and the day after, and the rabbis understand that following a chag is sort of special. There's a moment that happens that's still kind of connected to the holiday that we just did, but it's not the holiday anymore. And for Pesach, for the holiday of Passover, that moment comes with questions, as it should. Passover is a day, holiday of questions. But it comes with questions for our people because the question is, once we've got out of Egypt, once we're free, what do we do with that freedom? And I would argue that the same question is this question that we're thinking or should be thinking about today. Yeah, yeah we've got free speech. That's a freedom that everyone has. What do you do with it? That's the question. What do we do with the freedoms and the gifts that we've been given? And it's a question that the rabbis ask in this week's Parsha as well. So at the end of all the laws, there is a line that we get where God says to Moses, saying, you have to tell the Israelite people, I am the Lord your God. Here's some rules that you, more rules, I'm going to recap it. And then, and then, God says that you shall, ushmartem et chukot ve'et mishpatai, you shall, right, you have to observe all of my laws, that you're going to do them, you shall do all of these rules, 100 million bonus points, what does the word chai mean in Hebrew? Nice job, guys. Chai, you shall live bahem in them. That's the cap to all of the laws that have been given, is don't forget, these are rules, and you are going to live by these rules. And so the rabbis approach this, you know, as they do like a menu at Starbucks and start to try to figure out the different variations on what v'chai behem might mean. And they come up with a few interesting answers that are getting at the question of what's the point of everything that we're doing here? Right? Okay, don't eat pig. Got it. All right, Shabbat's a good holiday. Got it. V'chai behem, but you have to live according to these rules. What does it mean to live in them? So Rashi says, live in them, of course, means in olam haba, in the next life. It means this is God's promise that if you do all of these rules, you will get eternal life and salvation in the world to come. Please God. Now this, for the rabbinic reader, is maybe what we expected. Because why do all of these laws and rules? Because of what reward you're going to get in the afterlife. This has been not only a sort of common refrain for the rabbis, this was what kept the Jewish people Jewish for about 1,800 years. The reason why a Jew did Jewish things, why observe all of these rules, was because there's a promise of something to come later after death. Whatever it might be, you will get a reward. I kind of want to ask you to raise your hand if that's the reason why you do Jewish things today, but I'm not going to. But you can think internally. Right now, Mordechai Kaplan in the early 1900s writes, 
<laughs> no one believes this anymore. Right? He said that this is what, the, why the Jewish people did what they did for, again, about 1,800 years, was to achieve some sort of salvation, but it was no longer the operable thing, reason for Jews to do Jewish things, starting, according to Kaplan, in uh, the late 1840s and moving on. Now, I think that he is an astute reader of the human psyche, and that might be true, I kind of want to make an argument to bring that back just a little bit. Again, I don't know what happens when we die. I don't know what the reward's going to be. You've got to ask a wise, Rabbi Cooper for that. You've got to ask a, a more sagacious person than I about what, that. But the idea that we do what we do because it is cosmically right, because it is something God wants us to do, I think is a powerful motivator. It helps us feel like we're connected to something larger than ourselves, something to be proud of. We are doing what God wants us to do, and that is an okay thing to think. Whatever your theology is, that is an okay thing to be. And when you take on doing Jewish tradition or Jewish rituals, to know that you, just by dint of the fact that you are doing it, are doing something holy, is the birthright of every Jew or everyone who's chosen to be a part of our people. It's an important thing. Now, a later rabbi says something different. Chizkuni says, the reason, when it says, v'chai behem, that you shall live according to these laws, means, according to him, that failure to do so will bring about a person's death, chas v'shalom, God forbid, and the Jewish nation will cease. So, According to Chizkuni, why do we do all these rules? When it says v'chai behem, it's not a reward in later in life. It's actually a national existence. If Jews stop observing Shabbos, if Jews stop all of the different laws, we will no longer be Jews. We'll no longer be there. We won't have a people anymore. Now, again, Chizkuni's not wrong. There's a great Haram line that just as the Jews have kept Shabbat, anyone? Shabbat has kept the Jews. Ah, nice. Okay, good. This is this fun call and response uh, quiz uh, section of our... But it's not inaccurate. Being a Jew means doing certain things. And doing those things are what has kept us together as a people. And as I think I've said this every week for the last six months, or I don't know, every year, every, uh, since I became a rabbi, Right? The rituals are the best way that the rabbis have come up with to pass Judaism on to the next generation. And 2,000 years later, they're doing pretty great. So doing the rituals will keep us Jewish. Being Jewish is a great thing. And doing Jewish in order to perpetuate who we are is one of the reasons why God gave us these rules. V'chai behem, so that the people shall live in them. And yet, we also know that if the only reason why we're Jews is to keep Jews going it can start to feel a little empty. Just perpetuating our people can't be the only reason why we do everything. But there are plenty of times where it's a good reason. And it might be all that we have. And we're, we're going to talk in a little bit about Yom HaShoah. And there are moments in our people's lives where just survival is the best that we can hope for. And thank God for the Jews in our past who have fought for our survival so that we can be here today. And finally, Orachaim, the latest of the rabbis that I'm quoting, an 18th century rabbi, he says, he notes that it doesn't just say, Chai behem, live by them, it's v'chai behem, and you have to live by them. He says, there's two different livings that happen. Yes, there's the reward that happens in uh, the next world, but it also means that if you live according to Jewish laws, you will reap some sort of reward in this world as well. It'll be good for you in some way to do Jewish ritual and Jewish laws. It will bring your life a little bit of meaning, something sweeter, something nicer, he says. And that's why there is this additional phrase of v'chai behem. And I would argue that for most of us, this is probably where we are. We want to do Jewish stuff because of Chiz Kuni's reason. We don't be the weak link in the chain. You have to keep the people going. Maybe some of us have the Rashi and rabbinic reading of there's a higher power that's asking us to do this, and our service to that higher power is being a part of the Jewish people. And for many of us, we're looking for 
the reason why it's good. Right? There's, there's plenty of articles and rabbi speeches and things that are written about, you know, it's the rituals are good for our lives because of whatever pop psychology is cool right now, that rituals are good or it inculcates right thought or we take moments of reflection or meaning with a capital M and all of the reflective practitioner stuff, which is great and right and meditation is good. And so we're looking for these other kinds of benefits to what it means to be Jewish. This is also, by the way, uh, when someone says, well, why keep kosher? And, and, and people will say, oh, because back in the ancient world, pigs were dirty. They had trichinosis. And so it was a rule to keep you safe. And it's like the you know, ancient FDA or whatever is the reason why you keep kashrut. Uh, people looking for reasons why. And there's something important to that to be sure. And, at the same time, it does put in our hands the need to find the reward. And that guy I quoted at the beginning, Mordechai Kaplan, in the 1900s, when he says, people aren't going to be Jewish because they feel like it's the only way to find salvation in the afterlife anymore, he charges us 100 years ago and says, so, Jewish people have to figure out why be Jewish now. What is good about it? What do we have? And I think there's a lot of answers for what we do and why it is good to be a part of our people. And I thank God for everyone who's being a part of it because what is being asked of us in this moment of Yisru Chag, of finishing the holiday of Pesach, of finding freedom, is finding why we are going to be who we are. And we know where Pesach is going. Right? What We count 50 days until we get to the holiday of Shavuot, which celebrates the giving of the Torah. We, re we get 50 days of freedom, guys, and then we're done. Because at Shavuot, we take the Torah on and we obligate ourselves in these laws, which bind ourselves together which as a people and bind ourselves to God. And I, I'm going to leave you with words better than mine, which were given about 64 years ago, uh, 84, excuse me, 84 years ago this week, in the Warsaw Ghetto. The Piasetzner Rebbe, Rebbe uh, Kalman Kalanimus Shapira, gave a sermon this week uh, as he was in the, oh, I just pulled out my bookmark. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I remember it. He gave a sermon when he was in the ghetto. And he says this question, what do the people do now, now that we have our freedom? 1940, in the Warsaw Ghetto, he says, now that we have our freedom, what's important to us? How do we act? Why did we get out of Egypt in the first place? And he says, we got out of Egypt in order to go into the land of Israel. We got out of Egypt in order to build the Mikdash, to build the temple that would bring God's presence onto, into this world. And he notes that when the Torah says that God built the temple, it uses the plural of two hands. To build. When, it, when God creates the world, one hand. Temple, two hands. He asks why. To show us that this salvation is important, but that there are two hands building the salvation. The world's created by God alone. The salvation that comes in the Mikdash is by God and who else? Us. Exactly right. It is on all of us to help build the Mikdash and this salvation, we all have to work together. And he says, he notes, this is going to be hard. 1940, in Poland. Yeah, it's going to be hard. He says, this is going to be hard for us to do. And we used to be able to rely on miracle workers. There used to be prophets who would show up to our people and they would split seas and they would bring fire down from heaven and they would do all of these things. Those people don't come anymore says the Ish Kodesh, is his name, the Piyasetz Rebbe. They don't come anymore. So what do we have? We have mitzvot, and we have prayer. And the way that we build salvation is we do mitzvahs for each other. We bind ourselves in these rules, and that's how we build this salvation together. So it's on all of us in a world that really needs it to think about what's the next thing, we have freedom. We have power. Thank God we have those things. What are we going to do with it? What's important to us? What do we bind ourselves to? What higher power are we going to serve? What people do we want to create a long life for? Thank God for our people. How are we going to help that? What values will we hold dear 
to make our lives better. I didn't know you guys were going to be here. Um, uh, there was earlier this week, a child of our synagogue uh, was, in the, was in the news uh, because uh, on the protest, there was, they were bringing down uh, an American flag, and he and a bunch of his friends um, didn't want to let the flag hit the ground. And so they stood there, and they held the American flag up, while people were throwing things at them and yelling at them and doing all sorts of things. And, and, and he kept his cool, thank God, and helped other people keep their cool uh, because he stood for this value and they didn't want the flag to hit the ground. And it wasn't, uh, again, uh, the, the whole politics of the protest is that we're getting into it in that moment of saying, I'm standing up for this. This is important to me and I'm going to stand here and make sure that something I believe in remains true and remains honored. Thank him for um, all of us. And tell me made the sermon. Uh, <laughs> and, and I actually, I want to end with one last thing because I know I'm sort of talking about all the protests, but not really. Um, people have been asking me uh, all, all week, uh, or for weeks, um, what's been going on at my alma mater. I went to Oberlin College. Um, and Oberlin College, you know, like, uh, surrendered to the communists in the 70s. Like, it was uh, people saying, I'm sure there's a lot happening at Oberlin. Oh, the protest, what's going on at Oberlin, at Oberlin? And, um, and I've been calling friends who are still there, and I have been looking, at, and the truth is there have been no protests there until about uh, two days ago. There was one, one protest that lasted about an hour, and uh, safety and security the, the, said they were very polite. They protested, they left. Um, but what did happen, and what I, I want to leave you with, is um, that at Oberlin College, there are a lot of co-ops. So if you don't eat in the dining hall, you eat in a co-op and everyone cooks together and they buy the food together and they eat together. And a co-op that existed for about 30 years that I ate in for a year or so when I was there is the Kosher Halal Co-op. It is a, a co-op that observes both the dietary laws of Islam as well as Judaism. And it was a co-op that existed for a long time um, with Muslims, with Jews, with Christians. The Christians liked it because we had more meat than all the other co-ops. Uh, and <laughs> you can imagine the, the Oberlin co-op environment, not a lot of meat. Uh, but we had that, and um, it, had been, uh, it had been shut down for uh, bureaucratic reasons a few years ago. Um, and this spring, a bunch of students restarted it, or trying to restart it, um, because that's what they thought was the most important thing that could be done in this time, was to restart that. And I, I ate there, and I can remember a moment um, when a friend of mine who left Oberlin and uh, then served in the IDF, uh, he was a, a, a checkpoint manager in East Jerusalem for two years, and he came back, and he was eating in the co-op, and we were sitting and eating, and there were uh, a number of Palestinian kids who were eating in the co-op, and they were sitting there, and you know, he, we were asking, oh, hey, what, what did you do in your service? Where were you? And he said, I was a checkpoint. And they said, you know, which one? And, and we all got really quiet. And he said the name of the checkpoint, and they kind of looked at each other, and one of them said, that one was actually not so bad. And then they started to talk about it, and it was not a great moment of coming together because there's very real things that divide us, and there's very real things that we believe in that we need to stand up for. But the fact that we were having this conversation over some lentils that had been cooked by different people, the fact that the Muslim students would help us cook Shabbat dinner because we would be going to services, and then we would cook um, every evening and Eid and Ramadan for them so that they wouldn't have to cook while they were fasting, right? These are the things that we need to have. Shouting at each other is not really the thing that's going to work here. We need to find the reasons why we are doing what we are doing. Find what makes us proud to be who we are because there is a lot that we should and can be proud of to be a part of the Jewish people in this day and age. Thank God we're here and thank God for the rabbis and the Jews who've come before us to bring us here. And from our position of pride in who we are, we also need to talk to other people and bring them into who we are, tell them about who we are, stand up for who we are while standing with other people or maybe sitting down to eat with them. Shabbat Shalom.